it's uh, my privilege uh, to introduce uh, Professor Milind Sohuni of uh, IIT Bombay as well as IIT Goa. Okay. Milind, uh, he has received his uh, B.Tech from Computer Science and Engineering from IIT Bombay, as I said, so we share the same alma mater. Uh, so he did his master's uh, and, um, from University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and uh, PhD from IIT Bombay again. So as I said, he's currently professor at IIT Bombay as well as IIT Goa. And he's also been the head of uh, SITARA, which is the academic center of IIT Bombay devoted to development. So Milind is known for his work in both theoretical computer science as well as in development in theory mm -hmm. as well as practice. So in the area of development, he works on drinking water, on higher education, especially in aligning engineering and development. So today's talk will certainly bring that out with his example of uh, public transport. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Milin. Uh, Milin, please. Please. Um, yeah. Uh, so all yours. Thank you very Go much. ahead. Uh, thank you very much. So let me just uh, try out. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. And what about this? This comes out clearly as well, right? Yes. Okay. So good. So now uh, let me begin. So I must thank uh, ACM India for hosting me, and this is indeed an honor for me. So I'm going to talk about. I'm Milan Sony, as uh, Himant introduced me. I'm from IIT Bombay. And my last, uh, before the lockdown, I was at IIT Goa, a new IIT. And I'm going to talk about uh, interdisciplinarity in engineering and, and engineering. So it's really about engineering systems and how they work in society. <clears throat> so uh, before I go on, I must, I dedicate this talk to Professor Damdere, uh, who was my first teacher of computer science and uh, who deeply in influenced my understanding and also his hard work and his dedication. So this talk is dedicated to him. So uh, so let's go back to the main topic. So interdisciplinary engineering. So I'm, I'm really gonna talk about where are the new jobs gonna come from. I think most of our graduates are really worried about that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that, uh, that is of course related to how society actually works. <clears throat> so I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, public engineering systems and I will, uh, and, and I'll hopefully illustrate how interesting they can be and how many, uh, the sort of opportunities that they offer for all of us. So I'm gonna use public transport as an example. I could have used drinking water, but uh, uh, public transport is I think closer to computer science. So it's obviously work with my students, Sudanshu, Anshu and many others. <clears throat> so uh, what I'm gonna cover is, uh, what we will cover is of course, what is engineering? How do we measure it? You know, what, what are its impacts on society? And uh, we basically understand how engineering systems are embedded in society and their importance. And in the public transport case study, I'm going to look at the importance of public transport, how to measure public transport. Then I'm going to look at an enterprise uh, which actually delivers public transport, which is uh, Taluka Bus Depot. Taluka is a tehsil in uh, you know north of India, and it's probably Mandal in Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. It's uh, Taluka in Karnataka and uh, in Maharashtra. And then we are going to look at some of the data sets, uh, Form 4 and, uh, and ETIM ticketing. And then uh, we will look at some computer science mapping of it, which is GIS and optimization, which it's closest to. And then we will conclude. <clears throat> so uh, let me begin with uh, the first question is that how, how does, you know, uh, what is engineering? You know, so how do we measure it? And the answer is, uh, you know, uh, in newspapers, we will see that it's measured by uh, production, so industrial production, manufacturing, you know, how, how much food products we make, you know, including Ganpati idols, mos mosquito swatters, and in recent times, of course, masks, ventilators, PPs, and so on. But it is also the capacity to manufacture, you know, fighter planes. So we heard recently that, you know, we are going to manufacture, I think, 50 uh, fighter planes, uh, Tejas uh, every year, or maybe, you know, Ludhiana manufactures about 100 to 500 uh, machines, CNC machines our capacity to refine petroleum and so on. So there are many, you know, industrial measures of uh, engineering. <clears throat> but if you look at the social side, well, that's everything that is produced must be consumed. So it may be, for example, the number of microscopes uh, per million, 
you know, do all our schools have microscopes or number of buses per 1 million, right? So, you know, what is the vehicle of uh, convenience? What is the vehicle of uh, an, uh, vehicle of choice? And so these are product, product-based consumption, but there's also engineering services, you know, for example, percentage of farmers with access to electricity or homes with access to electricity. <clears throat> you know, of course, for farmers, irrigation pumps run on electricity and they are one of the big consumers of electricity. And, <clears throat> and then maybe, you know, a number of homes with tap water. So if you look at electricity and water, these are really engineering systems. So they are basically, there's a transmission, there's a generation, then there's a consumption side. <clears throat> So uh, one may think that, well, that is pretty much how you describe a society. That's not true because there are other very important social and cultural metrics. So for example, number of books published per 1 million or number of uh, birds uh, seen in a district. You know, for example, uh, do we see paradise flycatcher in your district or do you see the, uh, the titwi or the uh, red munia and um, many more environmental concerns, for example, you know, is there a free flow in our monsoon, uh, in our rivers after monsoon? And even, uh, you know, even deeper social is say a number of intercaste marriages um, in, our, in our society. So there are all these metrics, but we are going to focus on, you know, the social metrics of uh, engineering services. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at a simple engineering service, that of drinking water. <clears throat> so so if you look at drinking water, this is data, this is Maharashtra. Every polygon over here is a tehsil or a taluka. And what we have is percentage, this from census 2001, percentage of rural households with primary source more than 500 meters away. So, and the red spot is more than 30% of the households. So what it means is more than 30% of the households fetch water from more than half a kilometer. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's how an engineering service is being provided. And if you go from 2001 to 2011, we see that the red spots have actually increased. You know, so what, what do we understand? That drinking water is actually going, getting farther and farther away. <clears throat> and moreover, we know that it's, uh, well, last two years has been a good monsoon, but we know that uh, drinking water is not available year round. So by the way, the same is with cooking energy, I think, Firewood is uh, is the cooking fuel for uh, most of us, for about 50% of us. <clears throat> so these are, you know, energy, transport, drinking water, you know, these are basically engineering services. <clears throat> so let's go, you know, let's understand what its consequences are. So on the right side, on the left side is our familiar uh, drinking water uh, <clears throat> map. And on the right side is uh, the map of GER, that is gross enrollment ratio, that is how many students of the 12th standard actually go on to college. So you will see that the red spots here and the red spots there actually match. So, and that should that surprise us? Well, no, I mean, fetching water and firewood, you know, easily takes about two, three hours. So if our young uh, girls or young boys are gonna fetch uh, uh, firewood and water, they are not gonna go to school or college. And so, you know, and it takes time. And if they're not going to go to school and college, they are basically trapped in a low income, uh, uh, low income uh, life. So, uh, so this is one uh, obvious connection. <clears throat> but the second connection is also quite important. If you look at number of jobs, right? So what I've done here is I've plotted on the x axis, the available. So by the way, every spot here is a district. So for example, this is district Aurangabad. This is Thane. This is Ratnagiri and so on. <clears throat> so on the x-axis, I have plotted uh, the, the water availability, you know, in the cities of that district. And on the y-axis, I have plotted the number of jobs per thousand, formal jobs with salary. So what do we see? We see that, you know, the districts have to move to the right, that is improve their water availability before jobs start rising. So there's a transition which they, all of them have to make from uh, to the right and then up. So, which is, you know, by the way, this Aurangabad is an exception because it had a very good, it's an old industrial district and which had very, very good water supply about 30, 40 years ago. <clears throat> so, I mean, it, this is kind of obvious that unless the district has good water supply, industries are not gonna come there. So really what we understand is that we really need an industrial revolution of 
2.0, which was more about engineering services. <clears throat> so one question, you know, I mean, after you look at all of this, one question would be, uh, you know, why is it, why are we doing so badly? You know, what, what is the reason? <clears throat> So here is my, my understanding of it. So let us look at, uh, you know, uh, per capita steel consumption. So this is, you know, so we consume about 57 kilos per person per year. Now that's about, I think about 10 square meters of concrete. So, you know, if you, if you build a house, uh, then, uh, you know, but if you build a house this year, then you have exhausted your quota for about five years. So that tells us, uh, but if you look at compare other countries, so for example, uh, UK is 145, China, of course, is 477. This is 2012 data. So, you know, after all, steel is the raw material for engineering. You know, that's how you make, you know, uh, you make, uh, you know, chips or you make cabinets for your computers, you make bridges, buses, uh, aeroplanes, uh, you know, chemical plants and so on. So really, I mean, this is the, and it's very important for engineering infrastructure. So we see that really, I mean, even very mature societies like UK, you know, which have a lot of infrastructure need 145, but we are, you know, making do with 57. So the real answer why we are not able to, uh, <coughs> the real answer is not, you see, steel is not, is very easy to produce. It's not high tech. So real, the real answer is that there is no demand. So there is no profitable way of using steel and producing value. So our drinking water supply systems are failing. Our railways, you know, they are, they are not profitable while transporting uh, uh, commuters, uh, passengers. And our public transport is also at a loss, uh, is making loss and so on. So really what we need are nice engineering business models, you know, or social and financial models to, you know, actually deliver engineering. So what is happening is that engineering in india is not very profitable so that's the whole uh, that's the whole conclusion so we really need to uh, we really need to uh, <coughs> we really need to do better so how do we do it so we need better analysis why are things going wrong that needs research and that should trans translate into better training for our engineers <coughs> and the second point is that we need better formal entry points we need you know i mean even if you have a great uh, solution for the railways the railways should be able to absorb it or you should be able to approach the railways and say that, well, here's my plan and then why don't you evaluate it and then give me a job or uh, give me, uh, give my company a job, right? So this is how, uh, these are the two things which we need to do. <clears throat> so, uh, so what, you know, so what I'm going to do is let us take a sector, engineering sector, and just understand, you know, how we can we deliver value, right? So my claim is that, you know, the, as we, as we know, that the you know the fruits at the lower end or you know are really easily accessible and let's try to understand uh, so let's open the curtain of public transport and see what's inside <clears throat> so let me warn you that it's a real zoo out there and there are uh, many animals and so we have to model how they work right different systems which are overlapping so um, so i'm going to just go over uh, so i'm going to talk about the bus depot its importance of the sector bus depot and then the timetable, you know, which is really the service that a public transport provides, and then various other technical analysis. <clears throat> so I would have said stop me and ask questions, but I think that uh, you know we will. I will take up questions at the very end. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at the importance of public transport. <clears throat> so the first thing is that uh, uh, the first thing is that if you if you see how do rural people uh, go to work. So well, 30% uh, of, sorry, 40% here uh, don't walk at all or don't go anywhere. They're working from home. About 22% actually walk. So about that covers about 60% of us who either walk to work or uh, don't walk at all. So uh, then some of them use cycles. Well, and the bus actually is, you know, 12% of the people actually use a bus. So we know that, you know, for those people who are walking or staying at home, their employment opportunities are quite limited. And the more uh, public transport that is available, cheap public transport, the better it's going to be. Otherwise, if you see that they're going to buy private, uh, you know, motorcycles, which was 8%, this is 2011, and it is increasing. And we know that that's causing a lot of pollution. So we really, I mean, the bus system is poised 
to uh, you know uh, poise to really either lose or win in this race for public transport and the other point if you look at the gender issue we see that you know uh, the ratio of men to women is best in the buses you know they are very poor they you know they don't ride two wheelers they don't ride cycles they walk a lot more but they ride buses as well so even for that uh, bus transport is quite important <clears throat> so i hope that i have uh, given you a sufficient uh, understanding of how important public transport is it is also important for kids going to school you know colleges you know your school may be near you but your college is typically 10 kilometers away and travel to college is again by bus <clears throat> so let's look at you know uh, msrtc maharashtra state road transport corporation so that's uh, <clears throat> uh, so yeah so that's about uh, uh, that's the state you know the state agency so it has uh, 1.05 lakh people uh, 15000 buses uh, the number of people per bus is about 5.7 uh, the number of kilometers uh, it travels a bus travels in 310 now here is where the performance starts showing so you know if you know if you have a bus it should be on the road for 12 hours so if i divide by 12 we see that you know the it probably going at 24 kilometers per hour so either the roads are bad or the buses are not being utilized well enough then kilometers per staff 54 so is that good and fuel efficiency is 4.76 so hidden in these numbers is really how msrtc is doing <clears throat> so when we see if you look at their you know if you look at the newspaper cuttings well they're not doing well they have been raising fares and so on but what they claim is that about you know 75 plus 75% of the villages in maharashtra they cover and which covers about 91% of the population so it's clearly a very important uh, <clears throat> connectivity for rural people and especially our the bottom 80% you know they rely on on public transport and public buses <clears throat> so let's now you know look at an enterprise look at a particular you know we want to solve a concrete problem right so let's understand what a concrete system looks like and let's dig deeper into it and understand what's going on <clears throat> so uh, let's look at you know this is thane district uh, in maharashtra Within within that is a tehsil. You know this is Shahapur Taluka, so that's about three point six lakh people, and partly urban and sixteen uh, hundred square kilometer area. <clears throat> so let's go there. So this is how the bus depot looks like. You know there is a, a waiting room. There is there are corridors and there is a bus uh, platform. So it has about sixty five buses, about two twenty staff, two uh, seventy routes, eighty villages it covers. and a load factor of 63% now that's not good and indeed you know about uh, the the losses of shahpur about uh, 25 to 30% so really this load factor needs to increase <laughs> so uh, so the way they measure so here's the first metric the way they measure is that the earnings per kilometer so if the so category a is that if Uh, the earnings per so how do they measure that so if you take a route say it is 20 kilometers long uh, it uh, 30 time in a month it travels uh, 30 times so 13 to 20 600 kilometers and then compute the ticket sold divide and you get a number so this earnings per kilometer greater than 43 obviously it's very good uh, 22 to 43 okay uh, less than 22 bad and if you see how shahpur taluka bus depot is doing about 40 to 45% are either moderate or bad only 15% are good so here is a question which you know uh, we should answer how to make shahpur taluka bus depot profitable you know financially or socially so by the way i don't measure everything by money right nor do you and even if we even if i know that well it's taking you know is taking 50% of the students to school we don't care whether it's making a profit or loss correct because you know typically girl students travel free and uh, boy students boy uh, boys uh, get a 50% rebate so we really don't i mean we want to deliver we want the engineering system to deliver value so this is where uh, <coughs> where we are and i think that computer scientists can do a lot essentially we have the systems approach so now let's now that we have introduced the enterprise let's look a bit deeper 
so this is how the you know this is how the taluka uh, uh, depot looks like so by the way if you if you remember your you know uh, archi- intel chip architecture and so on so this is really the alu you know this is the alu and this, this is the instruction pipeline then there's some data pipeline and by the way there is a material pipeline as well so essentially there are three systems uh, there's a traffic system there's a workshop which maintains the buses and there's accounting which does the ticketing and so on and it is controlled by a depot manager and there there are various data sets etim and abc which are to do with traffic and form 4 and roster which are to do with scheduling so this is how you know this is how the taluka bus depot chip looks like <laughs> so again if you if you you know i mean this is my description our my students description so there are many many units what are the inputs and outputs one can easily describe <clears throat> okay so let's look at the first uh, data set which is uh, the timetable so if you go to the taluka bus depot you will see that on the wall is uh, on the wall is a big um, uh, uh, big timetable so it will say for example dolkham you know at 10 o'clock 11 o'clock 12:20 uh, you know 13:20 and uh, and so on so uh, this this timetable is really how the service of the taluka bus depot is delivered to the people so let's try to you know code it uh, you know step back and see what we you know how do, how do they actually deliver so there we will see that the taluka bus depot you know organizes the timetable in terms of form 4 or there's something called it's a standard india standard form 4 where all the trips so let me look at uh, you know so there's a shahpur murba trip at uh, 5:45 uh, and it reaches at 7:15 and then it from murbad it comes back to shahpur at 7:45 and reaches at 9:15 and so on so you know these four services are done by the same bus or rather these eight services so from here from murbad shahpur shahpur murbad murbad shahpur and so on these eight services are done by a single bus so that is really what a schedule is so so the schedule is a sequence of trips and what is a trip trip is a source destination distance which is 42.7 kilometers start time which is 5:45 and end time which is 7:45 so i hope you know it's clear what my trip is shahpur to murbad is one trip murbad to shahpur is the next trip and so on so by the way this schedule this c1 is from 5:45 in the am to 13:15 in the afternoon so this is about 8 hours and one crew of driver and conductor do this then in c2 we have these four trips and another set of driver and conductor do these four trips right so what is the schedule schedule is a sequence of trips where t2 follows t1 t3 follows t2 and so on and same crew same vehicle eight hours right so uh, shahpur taluka so this is the first thing which takes us from the delivery of the service to how it's actually implemented in the taluka bus depot <clears throat> so uh, so really i mean given a timetable if you look at a timetable one question is how many buses are needed to serve a timetable so for example if if people ask that no we want more buses for the schools so then the taluka bus depot will say well i have only 60 buses and then uh, then we have to look at the schedule and say that uh, is there a better way of you know including those uh, trips into the schedule so we see that uh, you know the the schedule is a a mathematical construction which affects both quality of service as well as efficiency right so you know what people get and the ability of the of the bus depot to you know of profit and loss <clears throat> so you know i mean there are many other things for example we saw that between t1 and t2 there was a gap of 30 minutes so one would say that well why is, you know if i if a bus reaches some murbad why does it have to wait for 30 minutes why not you know turn it back in 20 minutes well the reason may be that frequently there's a delay right because the roads are bad or maybe there's a traffic jam and maybe the right uh, uh, and maybe actually it should not be 30 but 40 right so again for example can the trip links be done dynamically so these are all scheduling questions which are quite important <clears throat> and mathematically too i think uh, uh, they can uh, mathematically too they are uh, they are very interesting because you know essentially given given the time table i can construct a partial order out of it right so basically one trip how given a trip what are its uh, what are the f- possible trips which can follow it 
and then you know if i draw for example if you see mpc to pjm is one trip which ends at 11:25 the same bus can do a pjm to you know harmal uh, because it starts at 12 so i can put an arrow here then i can put an arrow there and so on and i construct this uh, partial order it's a master tt poset and then uh, you know the, the buses is just basically a path covering um, of these uh, of of this partial order so i mean this is a polynomial time algorithm it's called the minkowski to problem it's related to something in data structures which you must have read dilworth's theorem you know partial orders all this is really this all this modeling is really uh, pretty much what you you can do uh, in a computer science class <clears throat> and you can actually optimize the number of buses so for example our basic analysis reduced uh, the number from 55 to about 53 so reduction of two buses but again it depends very much on you know how we don't know how uh, how delayed the trips were and so on so we need to we, to solve the you know the bus number problem we need to really engage better <clears throat> but uh, you know this this representation which is this you know this particular representation this form 4 representation it doesn't tell us that uh, <coughs> so uh, what are the villages uh, and on a particular trip so for example kinavli how many buses pass through the kinavli so that's there in the ticketing data we will come to that or you know how many villages in shahpur are covered is my village covered you know how many schools are covered right and so on so these questions the form 4 data set does not answer so we need to we need to expand the data set so a simple thing is to look at the form 4 you know it has a source and destination put it into some uh, map search engine put all the locations and from to and whatever you get you plot it so this is what i have done here so i plotted all the sources and destinations and here is the map i get right then i what i do is i add to it the village map which i obtained from the government and i put it here and i just color the villages differently so i know that so these are the places where the road network goes and these are some of the villages that are missed right so we already know you know we we already have much better information about what is this uh, service delivering <coughs> and then about schools well again i can go to the uh, you know tehsildar office and get all the locations of the schools and then i see that well that's good that uh, you know there are a few schools here which are not uh, close to the uh, bus network but otherwise you know the uh, the bus the st bus network is pretty much close to most of the schools <clears throat> right so uh, but then if you look at the if you look at a, a deeper question how many trips pass through a given location right or how do dense areas have more trips right so what was what was the difference here we were talking about reachability right and now we really want the schedule you know frequency so that needs um, much more analysis so what i have done is that needs we, we what i have done is constructed a graph structure a digital geography so in which all these important locations are points right and there may be some intermediate points because for example uh, uh, you know important locations or bifurcations in the in the road network and i collect connect this you know i connect this by edges if there is a direct road so this you know this is what i call a digital geography it's a basically it's a graph representation of the geometry and it and then a route just becomes you know a path in this graph so for example sabgao one route is sabgao you know fata fata 2 fata 1 uh, dolkham other sabgao fata 1 dolkham so now at fata 1 there are uh, two services or two trips which are coming to fata 1 two routes and two trips so this digital geography actually is a very very important substratum and that is how most of these google maps and so on work they have constructed a digital geography underneath what you see and but uh, sadly uh, none of our taluka data uh, taluka bus depots really have their own digital geography they don't know really they can't answer most of these questions so we constructed the di digital geography for shahpur and here are all the you know vertices and the edges so the, here was the road network it had about 1 and 1/2 lakh nodes and this was about 500 or 5 or 3 500 or 600 nodes so there was a substantial reduction in the data as well <clears throat> okay uh, so i hope that uh, so this was one thing <clears throat> so basically once you have the once you have the representation uh, of uh, the digital geography then it's a database question you know how many trips for example you know uh, i mean here you have an a vertex is either a terminal or a fata 
then a root segment so for example uh, so what is an edge it's a root seg a root segment roots are trip trips are and so on so essentially what we see is that once we standardize this representation you know uh, much of the queries much of the questions that we had are really you know queries to a database system and the digital geography is a nice way of coding what really is happening in taluka bus depot <clears throat> so once we have this uh, once we have the digital geography you know we 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 can we so you know the coloring of the map is by density is by population density in the villages right so this is again obtained from government data and now we see that well the road network the taluka i mean the uh, the st network actually goes through a lot of places with uh, with high density and then you we can actually plot the schools and how much do how much does this person have to walk to the to fetch the road uh, to come to the st network so all of this now you know once we have the digital geography we have a lot of uh, entry points into understanding what is going on mm -hmm. just hold on yeah <clears throat> i'm sorry there was a disturbance mm -hmm. so we have uh, uh, yeah so i'm i'm doing fine with time i think yes so uh, so we have essentially we have you know we have looked at only one data set namely the timetables or rather the form 4 which is the end to end timetable and we have understood that there are many points about efficiency about access which can be answered you know only if we support the form 4 data set with much more geographical data administrative data <clears throat> so now the so right now the the problem is that most of the the standard national form 4 uh, structure does not have intermediate times or intermediate uh, <clears throat> timetables for intermediate stops so if you are at kinavli in the middle there is no way of there is no way uh, that there is a timetable for you for what are the buses which come to kinavli that's the uh, that's the fact so now that gives us an interesting data fitting problem i think you know basically given the end to end end to end uh, <coughs> timings and the distances between how do i attribute uh, uh, timings in the middle so that's a interesting data fitting problem i think abiram ranade our colleague has worked on it uh, for uh, the mumbai navigator and in iit dharwad we actually students actually rode the bus and got the stop names and times you know ideal times so once this data is aggregated you know we can we can actually publish time tables right for <clears throat> so the other source for time tabling data are tickets so by the way in uh, maharashtra i think in many states we have gone to automatic i mean uh, ticketing machines so these are they are called etim electronic ticket some machine etim right so uh, so these etims etim data is very rich okay and and if we can gather something out of it that would be really great <clears throat> so what does the ticketing data look like so let me go through so this is a snapshot of a ticketing data so for example kasara to nasik cbs uh, one full ticket uh, zero half ticket 89 rupees was the fare and it, the ticket was issued at 708 Uh, seven, uh, you know, uh, eight minutes past seven, or if you look at you know uh, Kasara to Malegao, uh, you know one again, ticket was two twenty four rupees and so on. Mm -hmm. So because of this ticketing, you know, ticketing machines, now actually the ticketing data is available completely. <clears throat> so what does it look like? Trip ID, you know, <clears throat> so that's you know the uh, uh, date, start, start date, and end, and time of issue and fare. <clears throat> so uh, but sadly there are still many issues here so for example when did the trip start say for example if you have a ticket uh, shahpur to swargat a trip you know or, uh, or our old friend murbad uh, shahpur to murbad at what time did the trip start so the conductor has not there is no way unless the conductor notes down the time and this is the time that i started there is no uh, no digital representation of that so uh, and other questions are there that destination are the destination id standard are the trip id standard and so on so there were many issues which we had to uh, manage uh, and and we recommended to them that they should have a dummy dummy ticket when the bus starts when the driver you know turns on the ignition there should be a dummy ticket which is issued so that we know when the trip has started right <clears throat> 
so uh, so how do we so let's look let's look at punctuality so the first thing we we did was for a given trip you know find out when was the first ticket issued that is that's a good indicator of when the bus started so based on that we see that you know as scheduled about 20 you know 20% uh, within 10 minutes of uh, you know within 10 minutes was 44% 20 minutes was so you know but there were there were about 20 to 25% buses which were actually laid by more than 20 minutes right so this is uh, so i mean this actually tells us you know if a bus is not punctual then will it be profitable unlikely you know unless there are only one or two buses and they are in the whole and there are no other providers so in a normal system there will be many other there will be auto rickshaw there will be a vikram a six seater and so on which may charge more but which may just take away the uh, take away the uh, uh, the passengers meant for the bus so i think that this tells you that gps based time stamping you know and more guidance to passengers you know which will enable us to guide the passenger where is your bus so those are needed <clears throat> so uh, uh, essentially what we see then is that uh, yeah prof if you come to profitability you know there is no i mean we i have already explained how they how they do the profitability you know there's the earnings per kilometer but there is no social accounting here how many how many students travel or how many workers travel so we don't really know about you know whether the buses uh, bus system is really uh, we, whether the bus is doing its social uh, uh, the social uh, delivery whether it's doing or not so that's uh, <clears throat> And the computation of the profit, uh, you know, the profitability also is error prone. So we went through the we went through the logs, you know, and tried to automate uh, from the ETIM data. How do I compute the profitability? That was not really in place. So we tried to put it in place, and there were a few discrepancies we found, so that we corrected that. So this is really the ABC, you know, the uh, the the computation of the so computation of the ticketing, you know, from the ticketing data, the profitability was also needed some interpretation so which we you know which we understood so once now you have you have the profitability you can map it on the map and show well so these are your a you know these are your a routes these are your c routes of course the time so the region is also you know what regions is the, are the a routes going you know what are the what are the times of operation all of those are important but the gis allows you a good uh, viewing of what exactly where are your where are your uh, problem areas <clears throat> So let me now look at the last uh, uh, technical topic. So that was the ridership analysis. So given a path, you know, so given a trip, so it's say from Shahapur to Mahuli, right? On, uh, and the tickets sold from Shahapur to Manas Mandir, so many tickets, so many tickets from Shahapur to Mahuli, from Ma and so on. So if I know the if I know the uh, tickets sold then I can compute the ridership at any point. So for example, at this point, there were uh, seven riders or six riders. At this point, again, six, and at this point, four riders and so on, <clears throat> right? So given any, any trip, I can do the ridership analysis for that trip to understand you know, what parts of the, of the trip are profitable, what parts of the trip, there is a lot of ridership and so on. So now we did a rider analysis for say, you know, here is a trip from Shahapur to Pune, Swargate, Pune. So what do we see? When we see that at Thane railway station, it empties. So there are only five people. So really the bus from Shahapur to Pune empties at Thane and then some new people in Thane come up and go to Pune, right? So what should, so is it serving the people of Shahapur? No. So probably this service is serving more the people of Thane who want to go to Pune, right? So this analysis actually tells us, you know, where is, you know, who's, what is being served, how many people are being served and so on. So by the way, also notice that the average ridership is 22. So, and I think that the initial part is about 30, you know, 25 to 30, but later on the ridership, you know, in intermediate improves, but the average rider is only 22, right? So this is also an important indicator. <clears throat> so basically for any trip, we can, we can, uh, we can do uh, this analysis. So by the way, let, let's just come here quickly. So if I do the trip occupancy, so we see, uh, you know, we see the ridership is say ridership 27, 13, 22, 25, 15, 31, right? So 31 is good. So that tells us that, for example, now there is, there is a ridership of 13, which is constant, which is not, which is not good. 
but maybe we should have a mini bus which will serve that route so i think you know looking at the ridership you know of the trip and looking at what are the buses that you have you know maybe we have 44 seater 20 seater 30 seater we can have you know we can try and match the ridership uh, with the bus <clears throat> and there, there are many other interesting things also to note so if i compute the you know kirchhoff apply the kirchhoff current law how many people have left shahpur and how many people have coming to shahpur so you will see that more people have left shahpur more tickets are sold from shahpur to outside then from outside to shahpur now why is that so you know you will see that more buses are punctual leaving shahpur than coming into shahpur so if the bus is not punctual then there will be ridership will will actually suffer so this sort of tells you you know what is the connection between ridership and punctuality right so <clears throat> so how do i you know how do i just schedule the services so that ridership improves these are also nice uh, uh, nice um, uh, problems of optimization <clears throat> so i have already discussed the ridership and the uh, uh, ridership bus size and capacity utilization you know how how we can improve so i'll come to the last point a small point so we also looked at schools you know how how are how is the bus system uh, serving schools so we picked a school you know the school was do at dolkha this is the school and then we looked at the villages these are the villages for which this is the closest school right so we expected that students from these villages will come to dolkha but we when we actually went there we saw that these uh, uh, villages students from these will also come here and the reason was that this is an english medium school and it was supposed to be a good school right so this is its catchment so now we would like to ask so are there buses uh, to suit the schedule uh, so we see that well there was just uh, you know the bus the school timing was at 10 to 5 and they were out of there were only four services and out of which two may be called as you know reasonably uh, close to the uh, bus uh, school timing <clears throat> so and then if you ask the students you know it's a pretty sad story most you know if you look at who rides the bus so you know uh, jeep and bus so those students who typically walk you know the distance to the school is 10 kilometers they are riding the bus or the jeep and most of the people for example if you look at 3 kilometers to you know, walking you know walk 7 kilometer walk 6 kilometer walk so all of these students are actually walking to school so we understand that or they take the you know so the bus bus jeep You know, so there are those jeeps which are which are crammed with people. So you see how how it all pans out. <clears throat> so I think what I've what I've done is you know I think I what I've really done is so what is the point? We have seen all of you know we what we have done is unpacked you know we have unpacked this uh, <clears throat> unpacked the Taluka bus depot. We have seen what are the various uh, data sets. you know why are they unprofitable you know what are the reasons for their um, and uh, uh, you know what are the different types of ways or ways of measuring what is profitability what is social value and we have found that all of these uh, things are fairly simple and fairly easy to model you know so they are not they are min, min cost flow ridership kvl kcl uh, systems you know data structures databases etim uh, graphs and so on so what we see is underneath these bad numbers that so many of our students are walking 6 kilometers to go to school you know so if you are if you have a cold you know are you going to go to school no so you know if there was a bus you may so i think that what i have tried to point out is that there are many many problems within this engineering system which are really accessible to a system type analysis right so if we did analyze these we would understand it better so really now we understand why are why is uh, shahpur taluka which needs maybe 60 buses but it it is you know it just not able to provide a service you know transportation service profitably or with delivering social value so that really explains why our number 57 is so bad because we've just not analyzed our systems well so as i said it needs better analysis and better research and better training we need to train our engineers better to to be able to ask such questions <clears throat> so unless we ask such questions solutions will not come up 
and once solution solutions come up we need to you know provide our students and our institutions formal entry points so will shahpur taluka bus depot allow us to intervene maybe can we you know be a consultant to uh, the shahpur taluka bus depot i think that that is what we we need to really start looking i think the problems are there there and they're not very difficult you know the the you know the bottom uh, i think what i think bottom of the fruit uh, i forget the term phrase so that's there for us to uh, the low hanging fruit right the low hanging fruit is there for us to uh, for us to get and we really need to uh, do that <clears throat> so what has been shown is that bringing better analysis and research and better training so bring can easily bring 5 to 10% efficiency through operations it be, we need better social accounting we need wider access and many high tech uh, fashionable areas like gps gis you know uh, uh, are are there for us to use but we need a system thinking approach not merely tinkering labs are not going to work we need to go out there and we need interdisciplinary training we need to tell students that it's okay to spend a day at the uh, at the bus station and just observing people you know what do they do observing students so it's okay to uh, and we should be free to give credits so if a student from computer science observes and sits and does ride rides the bus just to understand how people uh, you know what choices people make that's fine <clears throat> and secondly it is time for it needs formal entry points as i said so for elite institutions like iscs and the iits and icers they have to illustrate that these engagements will actually deliver you know a uh, better uh, better system so we really have to engage with the bus depots the drinking water supply department the ration office you know if you look at the pds it has a great logistical problem logistics problem you know it has to deliver millions of bags of rice and wheat and so on <clears throat> so we need our institution need to seed startups and and help our uh, students or graduates procure the first work order you know i i you know i would like a work order from shahpur taluka bus depot worth 20 lakhs and i i know i can deliver so we need to you know get them uh, we need faculty members to really think differently and institutions to have that vision so i let me tell you that some of the most intellectually challenging work was this you know drinking water or public transport has been really extremely challenging mathematically and intellectually i have understood society much better <clears throat> so uh, for acm i would suggest that curriculum which is more immersive and which takes students out of the class focus on society and design so there is a lot of design which i have i think i hopefully i have indicated and collection of standard case studies you know the shahpur taluka bus depot would be a good case study for students to follow mm -hmm. and of course faculty training so we need to separate the hype and and where the real jobs are you see there are hundreds and matlab i think about 10 lakh engineering students who graduate every year and we need to find you know, ways that they can contribute to society so we need to really put students in the driver seat so uh, let me stop here let me thank you so this is a, a photo from uh, our a trip to uh, shop uh, some other sinner bus depot which i took my students to so let me stop here uh, thank you thanks milin uh, for a, a very insightful and very practical uh, Uh, talk and i think uh, you are known for applying theory to practice and for especially for so solving societal problems so thank you very much uh, we'll we have some time for uh, taking a few questions so first let me take up a, a question from uh there is a question from joel uh is it recommended to be a type of person who specializes in one subject than generalized in a variety of subjects um, or being a polymath possible in the current world current world can you can i see that question uh, is it there on the yeah go to go to q and a window okay okay yeah 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 and you will be able yeah, to see it yeah in the <laughs> yeah I, i think that you see um, the engineering curricula the which my dad studied and the engineering curricula which we have, we are doing are very different so i think as the companies have become specialized you see so have the curricula but uh, indian engineering or for that matter even the even in the us 
they it still needs a lot of generalists so i think that a more generalist training is really needed so that's the whole point i think that the specialization is you know a few very high tech companies need you know for example intel wants uh, an electrical engineering it, it they they will want you to do two courses in uh, ic chip design and so on but for a general engineer i don't think i think the training itself needs to be a bit different mm. thank you so i think yeah. that is the okay. training and our that you know just as we say that liberal education is a holistic education i think engineering is also a holistic social change agent uh, training so it's more like that i think we should view it more like that mm-hmm. uh there is a question from uh, you can also see it melan yeah. Uh, yeah subramaniam mm. how do you begin including I, th- i think let's repeat it for the sake of others so mm-hmm. how do you begin inculcating the practice of how to collect data and what mm-hmm. data to collect in in students so how do you inculcate that practice in students engineering so or otherwise mm-hmm. yeah go so ahead so i i think yeah i think that uh, importance of data you know is very i think is understated so even now if you look at machine intelligence you know if you ask uh, our researchers what are what are the data sets what are you working on so then that raises a question really what you know where is the data but that's not i mean i have used census data and you know if you go to any government office they will be happy to give you the data to work on but i think uh, using data even collecting small data for example iit students dharwad students collected the dharwad city bus data for themselves and once then they piece it all together then they see the reality emerge before their very eyes so i think that you know how that also includes team work data collection schedules you know how to make the schedules then who is a good data collector who is a bad data collector you know some of the you know some of the lower cpi students actually are very diligent data collector and understand the you know understand these things better so i think it just uh, the respect for data collection it should be there so i and i think that it the excitement of it when it, when all it's like the jigsaw pieces coming together so i think that's very important thanks um in the chat box there is a question from um, professor venkatesh raman what was yeah. your experience with the talukas and other government officials in their willingness to share the data and to adapt your suggestions in particular did you see a willingness at higher level in these organizations to scale up these solutions and analyses so uh, let me tell you that i have had the best experience with government of maharashtra agencies okay so and one very important thing is that i am from iit so elite being from an elite institution does actually open up you know they are very pleased you know the taluka bus depot she was a lady she had never seen an iit professor so she was oh you have come here and then you know you why don't you wave your magic wand and things like that so i think that provided you you show some humility and that you want you have come to analyze and help and some patience about you know what their troubles are you know for example go to the etim you know where the ticket machines are there then you see how those ticket machines are being charged you know there there's so many charges then they ask you can you do something about the charging so i think it's a lot more of empathy uh, is needed and then i look i present took it looked at all this and presented it to the you know the is officer who's in charge he was very happy so i mean small things like introducing a zero ticket you know to at the start of the trip that's a very small change which he needed to make so he says yeah i don't know how to uh, i have not analyzed punctuality at all and this is really important so i mean there are so for example the abc the profitability accounting we you know we automated it that you have everything in the excel sheets why don't you put it in the database and just run fire a query so then now everybody is doing it now all over maharashtra the same procedure is being followed so i think what my you know they don't want to change the schedule that quickly so because that involves a lot more faith so i think the small things they will do right away so and engagement you see in the water sector my engagement with the government is for some maybe 8 10 years now i mean now they trust us iit and our team with a lot of changes so we are actually building automatic you know Uh, designing tools so i think engagement is uh, very important and and elite institutions have to open up 
so once i i have started talking to shahpur now the local college can the uh, grunt work and they are happy doing it because they they also understand better so i think we have to we have to clear the you know clear the undergrowth and open the path for others to follow so uh, as you mentioned elite institutions also have to do this and we also hope that the governments and the talukas and those they respond to non elite institutions who are yes, trying yes, to do good work yes. so either on either sides i think yes, yes. good work yes. is happening and uh, hopefully we will see good response we seeing better response there okay. is another question uh from an attendee how will bachelors in programming and data science help us in uh, coming future and uh, since you also mentioned that acm could also take up certain things so your answer might provide some direction also in the sense yeah, so what I, I change that, in curriculum yes. yeah I, i think that you know machine intelligence data i mean these are all uh, important areas so i'm not but i think that what can a normal programming person do right and what are the real what places can he deliver value i think those avenues need to be opened up from by acm and who can advise aict i think taluka bus depot another uh, just one example but i have worked with district collectors they are they have now faced with contracts for pds trucks how many trucks do i need for my pds so these and right now you know they make an order of scale you know a contract which should be you know at 10 paisa per uh, per bag per kilometer is at 1 you know 1 rupee so they are making a mistake of an order of magnitude and basic programming you know entry point programming for students i mean if we do it will help but this hackathon business is not going to help i think it has to be institution led the institution provides the continuity so student on their on their own do some hackathon and get on with it that's not going to work i think the institution has an important role of guiding ensuring the reports meet a certain status, uh, quality they are actionable and they are you know um, they can they are defendable so they, that it's an uh, it's a scientific output and the institution should be should be able to stand behind it okay, this is what we have done and i think that this can be and the collectors district collectors are up to here with work you know if any systematic out input they get they will be very happy you know the collector is you know is even higher than vishnu in my ranking <clears throat> i mean they are really messed up right. mm. uh another question this one is from jayant jayant harichha uh do you see your students continuing this kind of work even after they leave uh, iitb or how can they continue after leaving i well, well i think we uh, you know those students in that photo are from uh, my course development engineering which was for undergrads so about 25% of the students actually go on in you know into careers which are either entrepreneurial careers or you know or they move into something which is more uh, 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 something which is more interfacial so i think it does help them and the world is going to be interfacial i mean even in computer science we see that most of the contributions to computer science are now coming from outside computer science mm. so we need computer science needs this and we are better placed for such uh, you know because we are system thinkers mm. thanks another question uh, we'll take uh, from abhijat abhijat vichare how does such excellent work help a teacher in the day to day teaching any personal examples or anecdotes oh it share? is uh, it is very it is i think it's very inspiring because you are you know what you teach normally you can is available on youtube or in coursera but you know what you how you behave in front of the taluka bus depot or the is officer or with normal uh, students that is where the learning actually happens and that is where you 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 will find it very fulfilling that as a teacher you know you have actually taught how society runs and what is the role of you know a teacher as a mediator between students who are young people and society at large and how is value really delivered so it is it is extremely inspiring you know it's a it's very because you are actually you have you are seeing the problem for the first time and you are opening up the you know the uh, box of worms and then you are in the with the gentleness that you open the box and pull out one worm at a time respect it and you know uh, open up the whole thing 
that makes such a big impact on students hmm. Hmm? uh milen uh you said it was very inspiring your experiences and things mm-hmm. like that i must say it on behalf of everyone so what you shared with us has been very inspiring as well for all of us so thank you very much uh, thank you that mm-hmm. uh for spending time with us and sharing your thoughts sharing your work uh and uh, well continue the good work and uh, okay, as you, per your suggestion as per your suggestion we at acm as well as other institutions and so on we will take up your suggestions and thank you very much which in as well you. okay thank, thank you, you. um the so, well, dbp professor fartak has be has a comment saying that great session belen yeah uh, thank of course you. he he's been aware yeah. of your work uh, uh, well you know i yeah. mean fatak dhamdere all of these are really like my you know absolutely my, uh, i'm very uh, affected matlab affected by what all they have done for me you know uh, yeah. proud deepak patak dhamdere were the stalwarts and i mean they have been the role models and and their work in society of high quality uh, has been very inspiring so there's no question you know. so instead of uh, you know my words my wrap up comments about you to thank you um, i'm going to just repeat what dbp said because yeah, yeah, i yeah. couldn't have said it better okay uh, he says i've been aware of your passion glad to see it percolating to many more involvement empathy humility small changes and the role of an engineer uh in all this most of all your real joy of making an impact in teaching using all the personal experiences thank you thank you yeah, so all of us go this from my teacher that's like that's really nice thank you bye yeah thank you thank you milind and uh, with this we conclude the the morning session uh